Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming by today. We really appreciate it. Now, we're going to be tackling some really fun stuff today. We're going to be understanding how you make money with real estate, and it's not what you think. There is a lot of different ways that we can make money in real estate. Now, that can get kind of confusing. So we're going to be covering all the different ways that you make money in real estate today. So if we uh, jump right into it, we're going to be pulling things up on the screen so that we can understand them well together. And at the same time, we're going to be able to cover it together, ask questions together. We can learn from each other. That's our main goal for today. All right. So if we go into this, we're going to just turn the screens a little bit and we're going to jump into here and we're going to start covering all of the different ways that we can get money in real estate. And it's all going to be on this board right here. All right. So let's uh, see if we can make sense of this. We're just going to flip this screen around. So you guys are all going to be live on TikTok and YouTube. If you have any questions, you can come right on and, and ask me questions. We're going to go over this piece by piece. And hopefully we're going to learn some really, really cool stuff. Um, this is from a previous teaching session. So let's just ignore that for now. We're going to erase this. And we're going to get into houses. So the main question always is real estate. Why real estate? Why would you do this? And there is so many ways that we can make money in real estate. Now, what are those ways? So how do we make money in real estate? So the first one that everybody always talks about is cash flow. Okay, so cash flow is extremely important. If we have cash flow, then we want to buy that property. Now, cash flow is the first way, but what are the other ways that we make money? We'll also make it through amortization. So what does that mean, by the way? That is the length of your loan. So the amortization is normally, what is it in Canada? Normally 25 years. In the US, it's normally 30 years. That's the number one product that they have, um, but it could be anything. And this is one of the indications that I'm going to be looking for, uh, for us moving into some really tough times in the future. What do you think will be coming up? I think for sure it's going to be a 40 year is going to come back. I think we're going to be moving toward a 40 year um, amortization. So this is just for you guys to watch for. That's something I think that is going to be coming up. What is another way that we make money? We're going to be going over each one of these individually, and we're going to take an example today. Uh, amortization. Then we have appreciation. Now, where do we normally see appreciation coming from? We normally see that in the price of the property. The price will be going up. So that is one thing that we're going to be looking at. So we make money on the price going up. Uh, then secondly, we have depreciation. Now, depreciation, uh, the word is something different in the tax code than in the regular English language. So normally you get to get a tax write-off for depreciation. So if we were going to take, we're going to take an example of that later, but in the U.S., they divide it by 27.5 years. So the total amount divided by 27.5 years will give you how much you can write off per year. And in Canada, it works out about four, 40 years, which is 4% per year. So we're going to go over each one of those pieces. And so this is where we make our money in real estate with cash flow, amortization, appreciation, depreciation. And then we have our, our value adds. So we're going to come back to this uh, this list and we're going to do one thing at a time, okay? So this is where we're going to get into the cash flow. This is the first one that we're going to do is cash flow. So hopefully you guys can read this well. Uh, cash flow. So our very first one, this is where new investors are looking first. This is where new investors look first is for cash flow. And this is the easy one for you to kind of understand because if we have, let's say, a house and that one house will be renting for, give me a number, $1,000 per month. 
and then all costs all put together across the board, if it is, all the costs for you, the landlord, could be, let's say, uh, $850 per month. If that is the case, if all costs and your rent is higher, what does that give you? A juicy $150 extra every single month for you to put in your pocket. So obviously there's a lot of different ways to calculate this. There's hundreds of ways for you to calculate this. These are my main suggestions is make sure that you always, always do not fall victim to cap rates. I hate hearing this. I it, literally to my very core, I cannot stand when people say the word cap rate to me because a cap rate can be measured over 143 different ways that I know of. So which one are you talking about? As soon as somebody mentions anything to me about cap rate, I'm asking them, how, how did you get to that cap rate? Start telling me because I want to know what things they're including. So what things do you include in cap rate? We need to have maintenance. Don't you think things are going to break? We need property management. I don't have time to go do that. We have to have that done. I have a unit right now that's been empty for three months this year. So obviously we have to factor in vacancy. What else do you have? Insurance. Oh, some people go, oh, I don't include insurance. Why not? That's an expense. What about my bookkeeper? What about an accountant? What about the big one? Taxes, people. Taxes are huge. What about these expenses? I need to be adding all this up. When I go to put it online, I have advertisement. I have rollover between tenants to go in and do fixing up. So you have to make sure that when they are talking about cap rate, that they're talking the same language as you because so many people go, okay, David, this is cash flow here. I have extra money every single month, but sometimes they give me a very high number, not 150 a month. They're going to go, this is cash flowing $500 a month and it's a thousand dollars rent. And I tell them bull, there is zero possibility that you are making that much cash. And then here comes the questions. Did you include maintenance, property management, vacancy, insurance, bookkeepers, accountants, taxes, advertisement rollover? Did you include all of this? Right? So this stuff is very, very important. Hey, I got a question coming in on um, on TikTok, you guys. You can ask ask me anytime you want. Do I think the prices of condo townhomes are going to fall uh, more in Pickering? Yes, they will keep falling, but they will not fall near as much as detached properties in Pickering. So this is um, how we would measure cash flow, okay? This is the first way that we measure cash flow. That's the easy part. Remember on our list before, we were going to start with uh, cash flow. Then we're going to go into amortization. So amortization is where it's important for us to understand what negative yielding rates is. Because this is where we make our money on, on the property. So if I was charged a mortgage today for a fixed rate mortgage, I might be paying 6% fixed mortgage. Could we agree that that is a, a fair number for us to pay right now. So a lot of people have this misnomer. They believe that if I have the cash in the bank and I pay off my mortgage, that's really good because in essence, it's making me 6% because either I pay 6% or I use the cash somewhere else. So by me putting my money into a mortgage, it's saving me money. That could not be farther from the truth. You're actually losing money. Now, let me explain why. So, of course, you would make 6%. But if we go look at what CPI, which is the inflation, inflation right now is declared to be somewhere, it depends if you're in Canada or the state, 8 to 9%. So we will see everything else. Did I have an S in there? <laughs> this is not, what was I thinking? Inflation. Okay. So if your inflation is above what the interest rate would be, you're better off to invest more. Do you follow me? 
it has to be higher than CPI inflation. But this is CPI inflation, and this is the key. This is what they call stated. So this is what you see online. This is what you'll see when you go and read anything anywhere. This is what you're going to be seeing online. But in reality, if we go to a, a website called Shadow Stats, you're going to see if they measure inflation the exact same way as they did in the 80s, that our real inflation, real inflation is, take a guess what it is, 17%. And, and I think that anyone who is buying anything in Australia, Europe, anywhere else, you're seeing this as your real rate of inflation. So in Toronto, rents are up 23% year over year. It's not nine. Food is up minimum of 50% on all items. That's not eight or 9%. Um, energy is up like 100%. It's not eight or nine. It's hard to find anything that is only 9% up for the year. So what we do is always looking for an arbitrage, negative yielding rates. So what is a negative yielding rate? A negative yielding rate is real inflation, which is we just learned is 17% minus mortgage, which is 6%. This is how we find how much we are making and that we are getting paid 11% to borrow. So that is what we're looking for. We're always looking to get paid to borrow money. So you're going to see the majority of this appear in your appreciation. But how we're always guaranteeing that is we are looking for that term, negative yielding rates. This is what we're looking for. So in a 6% fixed mortgage, we are actually, when it's 6% mortgage and 17% real inflation, we now actually have an 11% negative yielding rate. So we will get paid 11% to do so. And so it's very important for us to be in, investing into this because this is where we're going to be seeing all of this if we go up to our list the amortization. So what we want is if we can amortize a rate very, very long into the distance, the answer is here, am I getting negative yielding rates? If I am getting paid to borrow, then I want as much money as I can get. So when I go to amortize my loans, I make money on my loans because I'm getting paid to do so. Remember, the government wants to create money. They printed a lot of money when we went through the um, 2020. They started printing money in 2020 and 2021. As they were doing that, they have to lend it out. Who are they lending it out to? People like me who are buying properties. For money to come into existence, they have to lend it to somebody. And so the government is going to lend it to anybody that can. The banks will decide who they give it to, but they're going to give it to the people who know what they're doing the most. So if I can make money on my loan, the question is, how big of a loan can I get? And I'm always like, give me the maximum. So we're going to be seeing this price appreciation that's going to be coming in. Now, the price appreciation is actually in two different portions. Did you know that? So appreciation, of course, is the, the value of the property that is going up. Now, we will have a couple portions, as we just said before. We are getting paid 11%, but 11% is not uh, just the negative yielding rates. We have in the, under appreciation. We'll have negative yielding rates, which is a huge chunk, like we just saw just above at 11%. But we also have demand. And so how do we find out the demand? So there's multiple ways that we're going to be looking for the demand. When we deal with demand, we want to know the immigration. So we know that in Canada, there is 2.1 million people that they want to bring. This year, they're looking to bring 450,000 immigrants. And of the 450,000, remember 40% come to Toronto, where I live. So if we were going to back that out, I, I don't really, I'm not very good at, at math. What is that? Um, 
40 percent of 40 is 160,000 plus another chunk <laughs> i can't think of it on the spot let's call it 180,000 180,000 people are on their way to toronto so i mean that would be really really important for us to to know right we want to know about immigration that's a big demand and how do we know what is the the, the supply we are only building 250,000 homes in Canada per year, but we are short 1.5 million homes. So if we are short, there's no way that we can catch up to this. So if we cannot catch up to this, we know that the demand will keep building as they keep bringing the 2.1 million people. Hey, thanks for checking my 180,000. <laughs> thanks for checking my math. Thank you, Allison. So we have to make sure that the demand is going to line up. So we know the demand is going to be here. We have the appreciation through negative yielding rates. We have the, then we have demand. We also are always going to look up whatever your city is. So blank demographics. What are you looking for? So when we look up demographics, there should always be as close to this as possible. A population pyramid and this is the number of people here that would be a hundred years old these are the people who are 90 these are the people that are 80 more people that are 70 more people that are 60 and this keeps going right this many 50 year olds this many 40 year olds and keep going right wah, wah, right to the time you get to like all these babies it should be a demographic like that you want it, so none of the the developed world in england or australia or anything is like this none of them are they all have issues but my point is this is what a healthy population should look like and this is the best you should be picking the best one you can that looks like this so healthy healthy demographics and so that is part of the demand side so remember when we're talking about appreciation the appreciation is coming from negative yielding rates which we just learned about before, which is real inflation, not stated, minus your mortgage rate. That's how much you're going to get, get paid. So that is the appreciation has the negative yielding rates and the demand in the area based on demographics. So you should know all of that stuff. Uh, Allison, yeah, you said it looks like a diamond. <laughs> yeah, totally. So you can look this up in any city that you go to, period. So if we go back up to the our very beginning, we talked about cash flow. We talked about uh, amortization, the length of our loans. This is what I think will be happening is we're going to be hitting 40 years. When we talked about appreciation, this is where the price is going up on a property. When the price is going up on a property, right, we're going to be continuing to look for negative yielding rates. That's when we're going to be interested in it and making sure the demand is there. Okay. So now that we have covered the appreciation, now we get into the other way, depreciation. So if we get into depreciation, this is a, 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 new, a new thing all over again. Depreciation. Now we're going to have to use some numbers. Did I spell it right? Depreciation. We're going to have to use some numbers on this. So we're going to use, uh, let's say, uh, $1 million just because it's an easy round number. If you have a $1 million property that is an investment, um, just uh, you have to talk to your accountant or, or your financial advisor. I am not that. I'm a real estate investor and a real estate uh, broker. So I operate in Toronto, but these rules are the same everywhere. So if you were in the United States, in the US, they say take a million dollars and divide it by 27.5 years. So that's a pretty straight calculation, right? If I took a million dollars and divide it by 27 and a half, um, what would I come up with? Can anyone help me with that? What is a million dollars and divide it by 27 and a half? Can anybody help me with that? I don't have a calculator here, unfortunately. Allison, can you do it for me? I just want to use uh, real numbers. Hmm. Is it 27,500? I'm thinking. What do you guys think? We could use it. So if it's 27,500, if that is the case, uh, 
if this is the number that they would do, this right here would be your write-off every single year. So why would the government do that? Because they realize that your house is made out of products. It is asphalt shingles and tubes and metal in the walls and windows that will go broke and all this other kind of stuff, right? So if that is the case, if that is the case, then they realize that you have to continually be making these improvements and things wear out over time. So they're going to say every single year you get this much write-off. So let's give an example. If I had a company and the company made $100,000 a profit for the year, after I did all my write-offs, I now get to take the $27,500 off of this. Yeah. Which would then leave me, what would it leave me? $62,500. That's how much I would have as taxable income. So I get to write that off at 27,500. I'd bring it from over here, subtract it from my profit, and then that would be my taxable income. And this is where most people, most rich people, if you're talking about Donald Trump or Warren Buffett or any rich, uh, you know, property developer, this is why they want to use this, this depreciation to write off against their income. So this is in, remember, United States, 27 and a half years. And there's more to it, but let's just cover it very, very simply. If we were going to come to Canada and we had a million dollar property, again, there's a lot of things about this, right? So we're just being very broad. Canada says you get 4% per year, period. So if it was 4%, we would get $40,000 right off, right away. So again, if we had 100,000 um, 100, in company profit, we would take the 40,000 over here, subtract it, and we'd be left with 60,000, 60,000 dollars of taxable income. So it would become a write-off. So I just saved a crap ton of money by using this write-off. Tons. Is it 72? Is it 72,500? <laughs> I don't know, Allison. Thanks for helping me. But the principle is it's 4%, but Canada is a little bit more complicated, right? Because let's go one step further. Do you notice I said here in Canada, it's 4% per year, 4% per year, 4% of the remainder. So if we had $1 million to start with, and then we remove 40,000, we now are down to a new number. Now we don't have the same number. The new number is 960,000. So now we'd have to find out what 4% of 960,000 would be. It goes down and down and down every year. So it'd be 40,000 for one year. The next year would be 37,000. The next year would be 35. And it would keep dropping lower and lower and lower. Whereas in the United States, if you remember, it was take the original number, divide it by 27 and a half. And there you go. You're all done. Um. Yeah, Burton, this is exactly right. So the depreciation is what they call it in uh, United States. In Canada, the 4%, they do call it CCA or capital cost allowance. So there's a lot of different buildings in it, but this is how the rich pay zero taxes. So normally, all the people that we're talking about, these gurus that you're talking about online, I don't care who it is, they are all using depreciation to pay no taxes or they're using some form of permanent life insurance. So when you go into the beginning part of the year, you're going to be seeing a lot of companies that are holding off. But halfway through the year in July, September, something like that, when companies start seeing how much profits they make, now they're out there trying to buy properties in the last half of the year to negate their tax bills. Imagine if you had a choice that... Either you can pay a million dollars in taxes or you can go buy a $7 million building and pay no taxes. And that is what they're confronting all the time. Oh, um, thank you, Allison. You said so the 4% of 960,000 would be 38,400. So did you notice it went from 40,000 all the way down to 38,400? And it will just keep dropping bit by bit every single year 
all the way. And it would take about 40 years for you to write it off. So this is where depreciation, that's that section that we dealt with. So uh, you guys, I'm going to be putting this all up on my YouTube channel. If I'm giving you any value whatsoever, any value on TikTok, please consider subscribing to me and go over to my YouTube, please, Rough Team Realty. Uh, I post the stuff up on my uh, YouTube channel. I'm really trying to get to a thousand people uh, over on my YouTube. So I'd really appreciate it if you do. We put a lot of time and effort into all of our videos. Our entire team, Ray and Glenn and Tessa, we're all trying to help everybody. So please try to go over to our YouTube channel. Please like and subscribe on my YouTube channel. Please, please. Okay, you guys. So where we covered cash flow. Uh, amortization, depreciation, appreciation. And then what is this last one we have is value adds. And this is where we make a lot of money. So our last one that we're going to be covering for now is value adds. So what do you think a value add would be? It was how do I add value to a building? So let's just use uh, some very, very, very simple math, okay? So if we have $1 million building, let's say, and we're going to say it's 10 units. We're just trying to make it very easy, okay? And each unit rents for 1000 per month, okay? If this is the case, if this is the case, we can say that it's making 1% per month. Ten, so 10 units times 1,000 equals $10,000 per month. 10,000 to 1 million is 1% 1 per month. That's how it's expressed. So just so that we have this really easy, this is where we start adding value. So then we start shopping around two tenants and we want to see how we can get more money for them. We want to see what they will pay for. What is a good idea? So when we start asking value, we want to know about covered parking. And this also goes into decks because sometimes they want the decks covered. Sometimes we can build the deck. What about if we make the kitchen better? What about if we redo the bathrooms or add a bathroom? What if we are willing to add hardwood floors to it? Now we're adding value, more value, more value to the building by improving the building. But we don't do this for free. We're going to say if we add a covered parking and a bathroom, we want an extra $100 per month. If we do three of them, we might want $150 more a month. What are we trying to get to? Um Uh, Allison, thank you very much for all your questions. I know that you must have been behind a little bit. If you follow me on YouTube at Rough Team Realty, we try to turn it around in one to two days. Um, so this is where we're adding value to the unit. Okay, we're adding parking, decks, kitchen, bathroom, hardwood. We're trying to improve the value of the property by offering somebody more money. They got to give me more rent to do these things. In addition... I'm now also going to be exploring solar on the top of the building. I also have some buildings that we put signage on and we get money coming in for signage. We also have buildings that we have antennas. I, I can never spell antennas, right? Antennas on, on the top. This is for like Bell and stuff where we can get money for that. I have crypto miners that run in the buildings. So if you can now add more value by adding solar and signage, antennas, crypto miners, all running on the same property, why wouldn't we do that? Oh, also um, on top of covered parking, we also extend driveways. We extend driveways often to get extra parking. We've also built she sheds. I love those. <laughs> Where you take a, um, a little what would you call a shed in the backyard? And instead of using it for your snowblower, you actually uh, completely fit it out. You put electricity in it, you put flooring in it, and then you could use it for three times of the, um, you can get more rent for it and you can use it for three seasons. So 
Uh, this is all different ways that you can add value. So how do we do that? So just let's take an example that I'm able to bring a covered parking, uh, for example, and maybe a bathroom. So now I'm going to charge them maybe an extra $100 per month based on this. And then I find another way for me to maybe make another $100 or $200 here a month. And now I'm up to $1,300 per month. So say though that I boosted this we're going to split this in half. And now I'm making $1,300 per unit times 10. Now I'm making how much per month? 13,000. Making 13 grand. So if we were going to follow this same 1% per month, exactly the same, my property now went to 1,300,000. It's now up to a million three hundred thousand for the building. So I went from the building being worth a million dollars to now the building is worth one point three million dollars because of all the value that I added. So I did that by, for example, adding things that they want: covered parking decks, kitchen, bathroom, extending driveways, she sheds, bathrooms, hardwood. We've even added extra rooms in the basements before. Added a bathroom in the basement. So that's all great ways. And then you have to now start doing your work. Solar, signage, antennas, crypto miners, stuff that you can do on the side. And then we go into cost cutting. So we call this hardening. Okay. Hardening the property. What is hardening the property? That's standardizing. So if you standardize everything, and we're talking about all using the same bathtub fixtures, all having the same countertops, all of the buildings, I don't have to keep large supplies of them, all ha will have the same flooring. What type of flooring? We're going to go into a uh, high traffic vinyl. So once we start going through this, I want low energy bulbs. Low flow water. Whoops. Low flow water. So this is into the hardening. So now I'm just, I'm not only adding value, but I'm also crushing my expenses. Also, we're also going to look for property management. Can we get that lower? So look at what I'm doing when we move into the house. I'm going to be buying the building at a, at a lower price that I already know I'm making money. Then I'm going to be starting to look at what I can sell. Can I get covered parking, kitchens, bathrooms, hardwoods? Can I put in decks, et cetera? Then I start looking at how I can make more money through solar signage, antennas, crypto miners, or something like that that we have running. Then we get into the hardening of the property where we're standardizing everything, lowering our energy bill, lowering our water bill, lowering our property management bill. And then we get into the final portion, which is extra. So where can we get extra money? And this is where we start charging for pets. Pets could be something like $30 per month. Now they add a lot of wear and tear on the building, right? Because uh, dogs, for example, have long nails. They tear up the floors a lot. So uh, we charge for pets, also laundry. Sometimes we'll have laundry in our buildings. Oh, that's not spelled right. We'll have laundry, like a coin laundry in the place. Uh, sometimes we charge for parking because some people don't want parking. So they can buy an extra spot if they want. So now I can start getting some extra money this way too. So guys, look at how much I'm, I'm adding. If I add parking, laundry, pets, I start knocking down all of my costs on hardening. I start improving all the things I can improve as a landlord. I also, oh, in here, I also put insulation. We always insulate extra. So there's less heat loss. High efficiency appliances. Always, every time you upgrade, then then this is where we are selling more stuff to our own tenants. By the time that we're done there, we may be at making the, the rents go from $1,000. Maybe now we're up to $1,500 on the rents. And here's the funny thing. 
people will be happy to pay the 1500 A lot of people will be happy to pay more money if they see value in it. So if you are seeing value, they will stay. If they had a crappy apartment before and a bad landlord and I came in and I started redoing their floors and kitchens and bathrooms, doing whatever they want and making the building more efficient and new appliances and new flooring. And then I give them all of these things that they want. Holy man, these guys are loving it. They're all over it. So, woo, this is a lot of stuff, right? So it's never as easy. I have my own siblings, my own friends that always say, oh, it's so easy. I understand. If you take a thousand rent and your mortgage payment is 800, I made money. (laughs) It is not that easy, man. Never that easy. I mean, every one of these lines could be a course in itself. But when we're in real estate, just remember this. This is all of the different ways that we make money through cash flow, amortization, appreciation, depreciation, value, and value adds. And guess what? I have one last one, which is the obvious one, guys. What is the last one? All the other different ways that we make money. Can you guys guess? What is the last one? It's called principal pay down. So in a mortgage, it is the only thing on earth that you can continually renegotiate. What do I mean by that? Is because when you go buy a car, the lease is the lease payment. When you go buy a stake, you pay the money, you get the stake. Um, Give me something else in life. I don't care how how high ticket it is. The price is the price. But in a home, you can refinance it every three years. You could refinance it every five. You can go fixed rate. Then you can go long-term rate. You can take more cash out, a cash out refi, refinance at a higher price. We can also do lease options on properties. There's a million things that I can do. So I can continue to renegotiate the deal. So in principal pay down, you know that a million dollar property should pay itself off in 30 years. So I would be interested in making a million dollars in 30 years. Sure, that's a huge plus that you that we just left out. But but look at, up here where we just covered before in this section on negative yielding rates. If real inflation is sitting at 17% and the mortgage is at six, I'm getting paid 11% to borrow. So if I'm getting paid 11% to borrow, my goal is to never pay it off. If I'm being paid to borrow, I want to, I, in reality, hope I owe a million dollars in 30 years. (laughs) The property will have gone up in value. So in 30 years, uh, the property might be worth 5 million. And I hope that I'm fully maxed out on my mortgage at that time too. I always max out. If I'm in negative yielding rates, period. So David, 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 you have a million dollar building that's went up to $5 million. I now have $4 million in cash sitting there. What are you doing with the 4 million? Guys, every time that I can take more money out of the property, I'm going to buy another property. I'm always pushing it forward. So instead of making a million dollars in 30 years, I'm probably going to make 10 in 30 years. So as long as I'm getting paid, if I'm getting paid here to borrow 11%, I will always max myself out. The moment that turns, if interest rates go above what uh, real inflation is, not stated inflation, if it goes above, I will completely change strategies. So we're always looking for negative yielding rates. What is real inflation minus mortgages? Remember, we're never looking for stated. Cool? Woo, covered a lot, guys, today. This is like a college course, crash course, in like 30 minutes. Anyway, you guys, um, I hope I gave you some value today.
Please remember, if you like this, I try to come on as often as I can. Please follow me on Rough Team Realty. If you have any questions, you can always send them to me. I'll try and help out any way I can. If you have any questions ever, please send it to me. I'm here for your health, wealth, and happiness. I want you to be happy. I want you to be make some money. Um, for those of you on uh, YouTube and those of you on TikTok, please consider uh, liking this video, uh, sharing it, and going over to my YouTube channel and uh, subscribing to it. I would really, really appreciate it if I helped you at all. Does that sound fair? That sound fair, you guys? I, I get one sub for this? I think it's fair. All right, you guys. Thank you so much. I'll answer any questions if you have them. If you have them on YouTube. Sorry about that, you guys. Um, so let me just go back because I'm sure that I missed a whole bunch of them. Um, Allison, you said you saw a fourplex for 730 in another province, but didn't think it meets the 1% cash flow. Remember, Allison, uh, 1% of course is the golden golden goose here. In in um, that works out to 12% per year, uh, but you're not always going to get 12% per year. Uh, you get 12% per year when interest rates were a lot higher than they were today. So really what you should be looking for is um, something in the realm of like a hundred bucks or something like that per hundred thousand. You should have a hundred hundred dollars uh, cash flow after everything. Remember all of this after all of the maintenance, property management, vacancy, insurance, bookkeeper, accountant, taxes, advertising, rollover. After you've done all of that, you should be ha about have a hundred bucks. It's better to work for um, work that way than always looking for the one percent. Uh, by the way, Allison, what province are you talking about? It's a smart idea on solar. Yeah. Uh, solar is a great thing. Make sure that you're getting enough money cash back. We just want to know what the return is on our cash. Um, antennas. Yep. We put antennas up on buildings often, uh, in, in the main cities in Toronto and so forth. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of them are, um, cell phone companies, right. That are doing it. Uh, and when they are put on the top of buildings, they actually help pay all of the condo fees. Crazy, eh? Um, revenue papple. Uh, you said, what happens if tenants don't pay on time? Well, you always try to be nice to your tenants. You want them there for a long time. You want them to be very, very happy. So we try to negotiate with them and make sure that they're in a good place. We want them to be okay. Uh, we have tenants sometimes have lost their jobs or parents have died or something has happened. And when that happens, we are going to say, I understand you couldn't work. Could you make it up? What's the plan? And then we're okay with that. But you also have to be investing in a place that the moment that you feel that you're taking advantage of, you have to serve them with a the notice to vacate as soon as possible. And that changes, right? It depends on the province and state you're in. Uh, some states in the US, you could be living there for a year, same as Canada, with for non-payment. And other provinces and states, you can live there only uh, a week. Um, Nick, he said, thanks for the knowledge. I appreciate it, man. I spent 25 years learning all this stuff. I wish some people would teach me. Um, how is real inflation calculated? Allison, that's a good question. Let's go back to my drawing board. Man, we covered a lot of stuff today. Okay. Real inflation is what I would call the truth. When they go into stated inflation... They, they actually doctor it and they change it. So what is real inflation? Real inflation would include housing, food, energy, and a basket of a, like a hundred other goods all put together. So they would look in 2021 in August for you to buy all hundred items and to have your gas, X amount of gas and food and housing, it may cost you $5,000 per month. And then if it was 2022 August, they might say it's up to $6,000 per month. That would be more real inflation. So this is how it has, was always calculated in the 60s and 70s and 80s and so forth. But then this caused a problem for a lot of governments because they were ending up with very scary numbers like 17%. 
That is very scary for them. So then they started to have to change this. And remember, they changed it big time in the 90s. They did it again in the 2000s, and they just did it again this year. So here is the difference. Instead of using housing now, what they do is they ask someone who has an empty unit what they think their rental would, would, would rent for. Okay? Empty units. They would just survey 1,000 people in the country. What do you think my your unit would rent for? And that is what they go for. So they're not going off of real data. They're not going off of what homes are selling for. They're not going off of the real data of what homes are renting for. They're asking people what their empty unit would rent for. And they only do like a 1,000 people. Come on, man. That's very, very different. Food is another one that really annoys me. So food, now they have something called replacement. So if you before, let's say up here in this example, we're going to buy, I'm putting this, see this big blue here? Does this look like a T-bone steak? That's what it is, okay? So if you had a T-bone steak up here and it was $10, say this year, and now it went to $20, there would be a 100% inflation. But they go, no, no. But if you buy hamburger, you would be able to get hamburger for $10. So now it's even. So now you're, they don't measure T-bone steak to T-bone steak. They'll do this replacement and say, well, you could get low-grade hamburger. And so because it's protein and protein, we call it even. We have no inflation yet on that. They do that for all of the items. So they, they, they don't measure real housing. They don't measure real food. They don't measure. They've lowered how much energy that an individual can use in the in the calculations. So this is where you have to figure out what the difference between real inflation and stated inflation are. Real inflation is a cool website, uh, Shadow Stats, and they measure inflation the way that it always was from the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, and they very high. And then they'll have what the government states underneath it. So that's how you find out what real inflation is. Um, oh man, thank you guys for so many comments. Uh, this was Burton. You said this was an awesome presentation. I appreciate it. If I helped you at all, please subscribe to me on YouTube. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, a hundred dollars per month per hundred K value or invested. No, a hundred K value. That's a good question. 100K value would be $20,000 down. Remember that you you want your $10, 100 bucks per month is what we would look, be looking for, right? Because if we were going to go look at a property that was, say, um, $100,000, let's say, we're going to use, we're going to see this uh, this little screen right here. What we're going to look at this, if you were looking at this, and let's just say, I'm going to add some numbers in here, $100,000 house. How much for maintenance would we put down? In maintenance, we would put probably around 8%. Property management would be around 10%. Vacancy, we put a, a fund to the side around 8%. Insurance, it really depends what, what place that you're at, right? I, I don't even know. It might cost you $75 per month. A bookkeeper should cost you around $30 per month or something like that. An accountant will be about $50 per month. Taxes might be about uh, 75 bucks per month. Uh, advertisement, it's not a lot. We, we, we would only put probably like $20 per month into that. And for rollover, how much would we put? Maybe 50 bucks a month, something like that per hundred grand. And at the end of the day, after I make all of these funds and put all of this money aside, I'm hoping to walk away with about $100 per hundred thousand dollar unit which would only be twenty thousand dollars 20k down hopefully that uh, that helps but that's a good question allison you'll message i'll message you about the details of the property but it might be sold already it wasn't on realtor okay cool thanks allison um man did i ever give you guys a lot of stuff today i think i, I gave you my life's work. I live in Quebec. What is different from the other provinces in terms of taxes? Uh, hi, Nick. Um, so I don't buy in Quebec. Um, the reason why, what are the two things that you want to buy? You want to be in a place that is landlord friendly. 
correct? Of course, if you want to be a, a, a landlord, I want to be la in a landlord friendly place. There's only two things that we're looking for. And one is what? Rental cap. Do they have a max of how much you're allowed to raise the rent? You want unlimited. I want to raise the rent how I see fit, not how somebody else tells me. I want unlimited. That's the first thing that I look for. The second thing is non-payment. How do they deal with non-payment? So if we were in, let's say, Canada, Quebec is two years. Two years, you can live in somebody's house without paying anything. Alberta. Oops. Yeah, Alberta. Seven days. For eviction. So in Alberta, they have to leave if they don't pay. In Canada, in Quebec, they don't have to pay. So this is the best in the country. This is the worst in the country. And all the other places are in between. It's kind of how the, the United States operates. So in Quebec, Quebec's a great place to live. It's only a good place to live if you have children because of the social structure and the tax system. If you're a senior in Quebec with no children or you're um, you know, starting off in life with no children, the taxes are obliteratingly high uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be there. Um, do I teach? Oh boy, Allison, you're, you're asking. I, maybe it's my glasses and I can't read. Do I teach IRL in real life? Is that what it is? I, I don't teach in real life. No, uh, I'm a real estate broker. So I operate, Allison, um, a brokerage in Toronto. We operate everywhere from Barrie all the way to um, the eastern part, Ajax, Whitby, all that, all the way down to Niagara Falls. So we operate there. But what's happened to me in the past is it's very hard to find people like me. Uh, because I've just been doing this so long. So I end up consulting for people in New Brunswick, down in the United States. We do some in Europe, out in Vancouver, buying properties. We just did one in Montreal, have one down in London. We're now looking at a place in Lethbridge. So we end up consulting for a lot of people because this stuff has taken me 25 years to learn, right? It's just kind of tough. Um, how would interest rates be higher than the negative? Mm, Allison, I, I want to answer that, but I don't know how. Also, how would interest rates be higher than the negative? Oh, than the negative yielding rates? So let's go back to the rates. Where did I have the rates? I, I'm sure we covered it. <laughs> okay, so this is where I'm looking always for negative yielding rates, right? So if real, this is stated inflation, and this is on shadow stats, if you look on shadow stats. This is where you're going to find out what real inflation is. So if you find out what the real inflation is and you subtract whatever your mortgage payment is going to be, 6%, then you're going to find out what a negative is. So what happens if real inflation is actually only 2%, but they're still charging mortgage rate of 6? If real inflation is 2% and mortgage rate is still at 6, then I'm at negative 4. And then I would switch strategies completely. That's when you have to completely change. Have I ever heard of heartflation? <laughs> no. I'm kind of curious what that means. Um, yeah, Nova Scotia right now. Nope. Uh, I don't invest in Nova Scotia right now. The only place in the Maritimes that we would be doing right now is New Brunswick. I was looking in New Brunswick, but uh, we just we had other deals going on right now. Uh what is BC? BC is British Columbia. It's in the West Coast of Canada. Or are you talking about what is BC or, or how about BC? So West Coast of Canada, would I invest in BC? No, I would not. Allison, heatflation. Are you, is that something to do with global warming? Not sure. Not sure at all. Man, did I ever write a, a doozy here today, you guys. You got me working. Hey, from New Brunswick. How are you, buddy? So we covered this really, really long thing. I think I answered all of your questions. I think I did really, really good. Um, you guys, 
So on YouTube, any questions? None of you have given me any questions on YouTube. I've got a lot of questions off of TikTok today. So you guys, if I gave you any value whatsoever, please follow me on, on YouTube. I'd really, really appreciate it. We need a thousand, thousand. If I answered any one of your questions, if I give you any value, please just give me a subscribe over there. This entire content is going to be posted on our YouTube channel within the next day or two. And so you can go back to it and read up, read it again and again. Um, Allison, yes, food costs is rising for sure. So when food costs is rising, where are we going to see that? We are going to see that in the real inflation, not so much in the stated inflation. They like to call, call something core CPI. So core inflation where they don't include housing or energy or food. <laughs> so what are you left with? Like, uh, pencils and erasers. <laughs> You got to see through what these guys do. It's kind of funny. Um, oh, no. What is, uh, how long is it for non-payment in BC? I don't remember off the top of my head. I, I, from what I remember, I think it was at around a year. So I'm not sure what it is at now. So that is for how long can you live in a unit for non-payment how long can you live in a unit for non-payment in British Columbia? It's about a year. So Allison, you're saying the negative inflation part was interesting. It sounds like it hasn't changed other than it's going up. Correct. So right now, um, inflation, real inflation, if we come back to it uh, today, real inflation has gone up. Core inflation has gone up real inflation has gone up. And so we also have had monetary inflation and we've had fiscal inflation. So once we put that all together, we're going to come up with these real numbers and, and you can either look at either the M2 money supply growth, or you could be looking at a, a site like this on shadow stats, or you can look at the percent that the interest, uh, that the, um, this, the SPY, like the stock index, the total index of the stock market. 94 cents of every dollar ends up in the stock market. So nine, if the government prints a million dollars, $940,000 of it will show up in the stock market, which is crazy, right? Um, so you always are doing this math, basically, finding out if I'm getting paid to borrow. You always are looking for negative yielding rates. That's the arbitrage I'm always looking for. So that... Do you go on a mortgage? Yes or no. Do you borrow more money? Yes or no. Well, am I getting paid to borrow? Um, Allison, did I read the article about the guy who was living in the realtor's house because the tenant wouldn't? Yeah, I saw that. That was in Toronto. So for you guys who don't know that story that was in the news, uh, I think it was in Toronto. The realtor was in charge of renting the guy's out, uh, property out while he went to work. I think he was working in the Caribbean on a cruise ship. He said, I'll just rent it out while I'm gone. He rented it out and the guy wouldn't pay any rent and he won't move. So now this poor guy working for $5 an hour down in the Caribbean on a cruise ship uh, now he comes back home. He still has to pay for the electricity. He's still paying for the water. He's still paying for the mortgage. And this guy gets to live there for free. The guy still has a job. He goes to work every day, but they're not allowed to kick him out. So now he's sleeping on his, on the realtor's couch because he has nowhere to go. But how many times have I seen that, uh, mom and dad with two kids own a house and they're like, I just got to get one more property and they buy one investment property. And then that guy doesn't pay anymore. They can't kick them out, so they can't afford two properties. So what ends up happening? They go bankrupt. They lose their investment property. They lose their own property. Then they're in renting again. So remember that it's always a liability. Whether somebody's going to pay or not, it, it can be really, really tough. Uh, yeah, and the board is very, very behind. Uh, court is very, very behind, and the court never talks about money. All the time they bring it up, but your honor, he's been living there for two years on, and I've been paying for him. He goes, we're not here to talk about money. I'll give him another three months to get out. So that's the thing is we live in a place right here that is heavily favoring tenants. So it's great for tenants, but if you're an investor, you got to go to a place that protects you as an investor. Cool. 
All right, you guys, I got to get running. Lots of things to do today, but I hope that you learned a lot and we covered a lot. Now, go to YouTube. We'll have it up in a day or two and, and you can rewatch this. There's a lot of really good stuff in here. I wish I knew this 20 years ago. I didn't understand it all, but this is really, really good stuff. If I give you any value, please follow me on YouTube. Thanks very much. I'm always here for you and uh, wish you the best. Have a great night, you guys.